Huzzah, my sweeties! Welcome to another historical vintage modern mashup where we take a vintage pattern which has some historical influences, trace those influences back to their source, and use the original practices from that period to sew up the vintage pattern, all while trying to stay true to a modern wardrobe. Historicism in fashion has been around since, well, forever, and I love trying to find what it is about these historical concepts historical concepts, mind you, not historical values, that has such emotional durability. Today we're going to be starting with this pattern. This is pattern 8109 from Miss Vogue. If this isn't a medieval kirtle, then I don't know what is, which of course I do. A kirtle is the sort of mid layer that was worn in between the linen body layer, AKA the kamika, chemise, shift, whatever you want to call it, and the outer fashion layer during the medieval period, parts of the Renaissance. They vary quite a bit in their styling. So you had some that had a waist seam and had a, a fuller skirt. You had some with long sleeves, some with short sleeves like this one, detachable sleeves. You had some with lacing down the front like this one. They could lace up the side, possibly on the back, kind of all over the place styling wise, but they could look just like this pretty much. Historically, kirtles were actually supportive garments. So you kind of laced yourself very tightly, not super tightly, but you kind of, you laced yourself very sturdily into them so that they sort of supported the bust and all of that. This one looks to be a little bit more relaxed which is fine. I've got other garments to sort out that area, so I don't necessarily need that in my modern wardrobe. I will be referencing this book. This is The Medieval Tailor's Assistant. I'm not 100% sold on this book, but it's fine for this project. So just go to my marked spot, which is marked, of course, with a darning needle, because why wouldn't it be? So this is what a medieval kirtle pattern sort of looks like. Try not to give away that much of their IP here. In modern times, we shape our patterns with darts. So that means you take like a big chunk of fabric and you seam it together to create a small chunk of fabric. And that works in areas like the bust. In a medieval kirtle, you don't necessarily have that kind of shaping. Instead, where your body is wider. So like here at the bust, you just have like this little protrusion in the pattern, which I, I've always kind of been fascinated by that. It's kind of like a very literal way of patterning, which is just interesting to me. I'm gonna assume, let's see. Okay, <laughs> so yes, this has a dart. Like you can see this little protrusion right there. That means that there is a dart in the bust. And I'm assuming probably one in the back of the bodice as well. So I will be patterning those out of the pattern using modern patterning methods to create something which is a little bit more like this. Also, I'm just looking at this sleeve cap that looks like a very big sleeve cap. Also got this fun book. This is Medieval Dress and Fashion by Margaret Scott. And I just, oh, hi, look, there's the camera. Um, basically buy all of my books used, which means that I get a lot of like used library books. So they all have this like super heavy duty protective covering on them. And I actually kind of really like that. So I leave it on. These are medieval kirtles from, let's see, what is this? 1380 to 1385. You can see hers here is blue. I've actually heard from a few people in that certain anachronistic society <laughs> that blue is very overrepresented in uh, medieval reproductions, that they used a lot more like red and crimson. Eh, I like blue better. I think I'm going to do blue. And as you can see, there were blue kirtles. They did exist. Here's one. Looking here, if you look here, and yeah, I did have to like search pretty, pretty hard to find her. But there is a woman in a blue kirtle and it is front closing. Front lacing is a little bit contentious about how, how common it was, but 
you know, we're obviously not making something that's 100% authentic here. So there are actually very few medieval extant garments. However, there are a few. Namely, there was a very important find in Greenland. It was documented in the book Woven into the Earth. I think I've got that right. And in that book, they documented that twill was actually a very popular weave for medieval garments. Wool was the most popular fiber. I will not be doing wool for this. No, we will be using cotton for this. And luckily there happens to be a very nice cotton twill fabric, which is very readily available. Good old denim. So I will be using this denim. I think it may be a little bit thick for, for this project. You know, it matches perfectly with what I want. It is blue. I think I will try to find some type of red or maybe pink to act as the sleeve. I'm thinking that I will make the sleeves for this detachable, kind of like playing off of, you know, they've got, God, I've got so much like string in my life. This means that the sleeves can theoretically be switched out as, you know, style and mood and all of that changes. Uh, we don't think about these little things now because you know, we've got fast fashion, which makes it so much more convenient and even cheaper to just buy a whole new garment. But that's just as wasteful now as it was during the medieval period. So I'm actually really happy to get some more mileage out of it, especially if I'm going to be making it myself. I'm excited. Let's get started. I began by copying the vintage pattern to tracing paper so that I could be free to cut and manipulate it without destroying the original pattern. The original video I took of this is absolutely not helpful since I couldn't get the entire pattern in frame, so here's a dramatic reenactment at half scale. To remove the bust dart, I first drew a line from the apex of the dart straight down to the bottom hem. I then cut along the line I had just made and cut the dart along one of the legs. It doesn't really matter which leg. Along the hem and up the side to the dart, freeing the outer bottom segment of the pattern and pivoted the segment to unite the dart legs, thus closing the bust dart and opening a hem dart. I then taped more paper behind the opening. Next, I drew a line from anywhere along the bottom of the armhole to the bottom left edge of the new dart. I then drew a similar line from the same point at the armhole to the bottom right edge of the new dart. We now have a new new dart. I cut one of the new new dart legs cut along the armhole and pivoted the resulting pattern chunk once more to get rid of the extra volume at the hem created by the original new dart. Lastly, redraw the hem and make sure not to add any length to the sides. If you're a responsible pattern maker, you'll now transfer this to a clean piece of pattern paper or just cut away any excess paper on the sides and call it a day. There, hope that was all clear. <laughs> I kept the back dart removal simple since it was a tiny dart to begin with. I just measured the total width of the dart and removed that width from the center back sans seam allowance, blended the line downward and added seam allowance back in. Ideally, the shaping would be evenly distributed, but this method does work. I transferred the pattern to the fabric using felt tip pen. There are extant garments with ink in the seam allowances at least as far back as the 17th century, so it is an historically possible pattern transfer method, if not a perfect transfer utensil.
as is my custom for these historically influenced projects. I sewed the long structural seams by machine and did all of the finishing work by hand. I started by sewing the center front and center back seams. I then pressed the seams open, trimmed one side, and folded the now wider side of the seam allowance over twice to cover the trimmed side. I then fell stitched the folded edge in place to create an historically convincing felled seam. And this is how I finished all of the body seams. Done with the side seams and obviously done with the center front and center back seams. So now I'm going to move on to the shoulder seams. Since doing all of this, I went back and read the Medieval Tailor's Assistant to figure out the order of operations for doing the sleeves and how to set in the sleeves and discovered that I should have actually done the shoulder seam before the side seam once you've sewn this shoulder seam, they give you the option of setting in the sleeve flat and then just doing the, the sleeve and the side seam as one, um, which is actually how I did it for the 18th century men's shirt inspired project that I did. I now have to actually set in the sleeve in a more modern way. Oh well, it is what it is. So I'm just gonna now sew up this shoulder seam, which will be done the exact same way that all of these other seams were done. And then I will figure out how I want to set in these sleeves. To make sure that I am making a right and left sleeve and not two rights, I always lay both sleeves out at the same time and pin the seams in place. Also, I just find mirrored images really satisfying. I first sewed the sleeve seam with another felled seam. These projects could honestly be called 1001 felled seams. Sleeve caps are very large and require a lot of ease to fit the armhole. I created the ease by machine sewing two rows of stitching using a large stitch length, one quarter inch and one half inch from the edge of the sleeve cap. I then pulled the tails of both lines of stitching to gently gather the fabric and used a lot of steam along with my tailor's hand to shape the cap. Just an FYI, I've noted the pattern and if I ever make this again, I will probably reduce the sleeve cap at least 10%. I have no words of wisdom for how to perfectly ease a cap into an armhole. Just turn the armhole inside out, the sleeve right side out, get comfortable, and commence fiddling with it until it looks good. Sure, match up those notches, but I find I get the best results if I just look at what I'm doing and make sure everything is even. I machine sewed the sleeve very slowly and felt with my fingers as I stitched to make sure I wasn't sewing any true gathers into the sleeve cap. I did avoid gathers, but just barely. Much steam and coaxing was required after sewing to get all of the almost gathers to lie flat. 
I do not recommend fabric this thick for set-in sleeves. I will always have some anxiety over how to finish my armholes. Historically, they would have been either flat felled if the seam didn't have too much ease or just left raw. Most modern sleeves use a serger to finish the raw edge, which is also not happening in my sewing world anytime soon. I decided to go totally off-piste and try for a kind of binding. I trimmed the seam allowance as tightly as I could and pressed it towards the sleeve. I then whip-stitched cotton twill tape to cover the raw edge. This process also required a lot of ease and hand-stitching witchery, since the tape was of course straight and the sleeve was not. I decided while I was in the area to finish the sleeve hem with another twill tape to match. Neither historical nor vintage, but it worked and it's neat. Now I had the neck slit slash collar band to deal with. I started by sewing the neck slit band and facing right sides together along the outside edge. I then sewed the right side of the band to the next slit, starting with the bottom, and trimmed the corner so that I could match up the two long edges of the neck slit and neck edge. See how they're offset? That's a result of my earlier mistake. I stitched to the edge of the opening at the bottom instead of continuing to the edge of the seam allowance. Oops. But I didn't realize where my error was until later, so I trimmed the extra seam allowance and stitched away. This resulted in a thinner band along the neck slit, but I actually think it looks more modern, so win-win? To finish the inside of the neck slit band, I pressed the seam allowance to the inside of the band, then pressed the seam allowance of the facing inwards, and fell stitch this in place. I added a reinforcement tab at the bottom of the slit made from the cotton twill tape I used previously. Okay, so I thought I would take a moment to kind of lament how difficult it was for me to figure this whole business out. It's a pretty straightforward thing, and I'm sure it is explained very well in the pattern instructions, but I am stubborn and did not want to take the pattern out and actually read those instructions. So instead, I bumbled along for probably about a day, trying to figure out the order of operations for putting this whole collar nonsense together. This is done, it's finished. Next thing is to attach this collar around the neckline. It's not really a collar, it's like a kind of like a facing flat collar situation. I'll put a picture up. So this will be the next bit, will be to add this to the whole equation. And I think after a lot of pinning and trying to figure out the cleanest way to do this, the best way is probably outlined in the patterning instructions, which I'm still too stubborn to actually pull out and read. Obviously, I've not learned any lessons throughout this process. This outer bit right here will actually attach to the collar, the neckline of the dress, and then this will, will become the new neckline. First, I'm going to take what will be the underside of this. So what will be, this is obviously, yeah, I'm just going to chime in here and say, step one, press seam allowance of neckband facing under half inch. Step two, sew neck slit edge of neckband. That's the bit that will be center front. Step three, sew outer neckband to facing along neck edge and press. Step four, sew outer neckband to current neckline of dress and press seam allowance towards neckband. Step five, fell stitch pre-pressed facing down to the inside of the garment. Of course I somehow lost the footage for this, so you're left with me dumbly explaining the whole thing in this vlog. Step two is going to be actually sewing the top.
Anyway, on to the sleeves. Since they will be removable, I decided to go for some historical accuracy here. Emphasis on the sum. This was all included in the lost chunk of footage, which is pretty annoying because it took me forever to set up the correct angle. Oh well. These will be lined to the edge, making them technically reversible, and I chose a dusky rose cotton linen for the lining, sort of a play on the red-blue combos I found in my research. Historically, the lining may have been attached to the sleeve as a flat piece rather than sewing up the sleeve and lining separately, which meant I needed to match up the self and lining fabric wrong sides together, based around the perimeter to hold them in place, and press the seam allowance inward. I then whip-stitched the shoulder and wrist openings of the sleeve with itty-bitty stitches. Tip, if you're like me and find light linings with dark self fabric striking, match the thread you use to the lighter fabric when using whip stitches like these. I always default to match the self, but a dark thread against a light fabric is super noticeable and will make the lighter fabric look like Sally from A Nightmare Before Christmas, whereas a lighter thread against darker fabric isn't as noticeable. Either way, try to grab only a thread or two from each fabric along the edge to make the stitch as invisible as possible, especially if you want the outcome to be reversible. This is a strange little stitch, and honestly feels like something I would have come up with when I was an undergrad in fashion design and forgot to sew a seam. Obviously I love it. <laughs> the self and lining long sleeve seams are stitched together separately by butting the pressed edges together and sliding the needle and thread through the folded edge on one side and then along the other. It's like a running stitch that switches sides every other stitch. It's not the easiest stitch, and mine needs a little work. That's what second medieval core curls are for. Originally, I was going to turn up and fell stitch the hem, but I decided to lean into the material and cut a raw edge instead. I ended up cutting off 5 inches from the bottom of the skirt, so the skirt hits about mid-calf. Oh my gosh, let's talk about how much I love making eyelets. I don't know if it's because I feel like a badass wielding an awl, or if I just love that historical eyelets can look like little starbursts, but it's always my favorite part of historical sewing. Eyelets are also super easy. An awl or stiletto is used to push apart the threads of the fabric and create a hole. Once the thread is anchored in place, simply whip stitch around the hole. Because the threads aren't cut, the stitches around the edge of the eyelet are really only functionally necessary to keep the hole open, and you only need a couple. I made some very starbursty and intentionally rustic eyelets at the neck, and did little crosses going down the body of the kirtle. I tried out many different colors of thread before deciding that I liked this undyed silk embroidery floss the best. This is only the second historical vintage mashup I've done, but I'm already noticing a trend towards using the best practices from these areas to create an emotional connection to the clothing we create. There are so many easy, convenient choices available when we go to clothe ourselves. But what the surge in popularity of medieval core, cottage core, and even just historical dress in general tells me is that we're all creating something more from our wardrobes. I don't think I know exactly what that is yet, but if you'd like to stick around as I try to figure it out, give this video a thumbs up and subscribe. We'll see you next time.
we'll be digging more into historical fashion and techniques, exploring some extant garments, and generally questioning what it is about historicism that provokes such a strong emotional response. Until next time, keep loving your clothes.